So, good morning. Uh, hello, everybody. It's great to be here among our fellow Blender users in Blender Conference 2022. We are all here, I suppose, because we're fans of creativity. And sure, we may express it in different ways, from uh, sculpting characters, to modeling environments, to even building custom pieces of code to help other users, users out. All of those things, however, stem from a creative mindset. And for us, in Team Otherworks, we decided to express our creativity through creating a whole new fantastical world called Otherworld. My name is Athanasios Velisaris, and this is my co-director, who just happens to be my brother. <laughs> and uh, just to give you a little bit of our background, I used to work as a freelance character artist for uh, games, and Michael was into all kinds of 3D, from modeling to his current preference, which is uh, real-time tech art. For the past two years, however, we decided to put uh, our skills and knowledge of 3D into the test and make an animated short, a snippet of the, wor of the work that we wanted to show to the world. So, take a peek.
Uh, thank you so much. So just to be clear, what you saw was the work of just two people. Other than voice acting, we had no outside help. Obviously, I mean, I can't do a girl's voice. Um, but uh, the animation was lit and rendered in Unreal Engine 2, uh, sorry, 4.27. But uh, the bulk of the work, including modeling, animation, rigging, sculpting, uh, most simulations and some of the effects were made using Blender. So let's dive right into it and see how it was made. So right off the bat, we knew that we didn't have all the time in the world. So we would have to resort to using some third party assets to help us along the process. And those were the more generic assets like the walls, uh, some desks. We did, however, want to uh, create our own unique assets that are closer to the camera or that are so unique that no third-party library like Quixel, uh, what, it's what we were using uh, here, has. Uh, the challenge was to create assets that were nice and stylized while at the same time uh, matching the color and the texture to the third-party assets so not having them look out of place. Now, the process for creating props is very well documented for uh, real-time applications. Uh, for us, we use a uh, base uh, asset, and from that we derive two assets, a game-ready asset and a high-poly asset. Uh, we use custom normals, and we also bake normal maps, so that's where the high-poly is useful. But what about the environment? Well, for uh, the structures, we used a modular workflow. And specifically for the walls, we just added some extra loops to facilitate vertex painting. And basically, we blend between uh, two materials you see here, the brick and the wall on top, the plaster. Uh, and we use a, procedure, a, sorry, a noise texture plus vertex painting uh, to blend between the two. But what about the exterior of the library? Well, in order to duplicate shapes effectively, Blender has had the answer for years, the array modifier. Well, it was, though, uh, there was, though, a small problem. We wanted to take advantage of Unreal's dynamic instancing. And for that reason, we couldn't just build something in Blender and then import it into Unreal without losing some performance. Instead, what we did was study Blender's array modifier and recreate it one-to-one -one in Unreal uh, using blueprints. And it includes both relative offset, constant offset, uh, and pivot offset instead of object offset. And it can produce linear arrays, it can produce uh, radial arrays, and uh, it can, you can also stack it up one uh, array after the next one to have a more complex effect. Okay, so um, it wouldn't be a library without bookshelves. Uh, the bookshelves themselves were a challenge since it would be pretty tedious to hand place all the books one by one. Um, had geometry nodes been introduced when we made this, it would have made things a lot simpler. However, we had to resort to, we had to, resort to using Unreal, Unreal's blueprints to populate the bookshelves uh, with books. Uh, that way we could also take advantage of Unreal's uh, dynamic instancing system as well. Uh, now geometry nodes exist, so here is the idea of how we made all this in case you, you would like to recreate something similar. So first of all, uh, a lot of parameters are exposed to the artist, as you can see, and these are not even all of them. Uh, at the bottom, there are randomization parameters from uh, book collections here called uh, book tomes to percentages of angled books, sliding books, and stuff like that. From more generic ones like the gap between the books and several angle thresholds. Uh, so the script takes all these parameters as input and generates random seeds for the various categories and starts, starts placing all the books one by one. The first book is always spawned randomly, and for every subsequent book, it first determines if it should look similar in appearance to the previous book that's being part of a book collection, or if it should be a new random book with completely new settings and stuff. So after that is done, uh, the tilt of the books is calculated. Uh, the script will randomly decide whether it wants to, uh, whether it wants to, oh, sorry. 
um, straighten the books, start sliding the books downwards, or use a new random tilt. For the first case, it looks at the tilt of the previous book and adds a recovery angle until the last book is perpendicular to the self. For the second case, the opposite is done, meaning that it, it subtracts a tilt from the previous book until the last book lays flat on the surface of the self. Uh, then we have to calculate the position of the book. This was a little bit trickier and required some basic trigonometry knowledge. Uh, three possible occurrences are being accounted for here. Uh, the first one being uh, that the second book, as you can see here, is shorter than the first book, and uh, the, the height is determined by the bounding box after the tilt has been applied. The second case is that the second book is taller than the first book, and the third case is that uh, a th the third book is taller than the second book, but shorter than the first book, essentially a smaller book being tucked between two taller books. Um, as I said before, we have the bounding boxes, so the formulas came out pretty straightforward. Uh, this is the formula for the first case. And as you can see, D is the distance that is required for the second book to, for the second book to have its upper left corner to rest on the side of the first book. Okay, so before proceeding to the next book or self, the script will store both the dimensions and the tilt, and then it will also check if the width of the self has been exhausted or not. Uh, the book stacks outside the book shelves were created following a very similar approach. However, since the pivot point of the books was at their bottom left, it had to be mathematically sifted as if it was uh, at their center. All right, so the opening of the animation does have a lot of clouds. Um, Unreal calculates volumetrics through translucent camera-aligned planes, and that's a, co a common technique for many real-time applications, real-time engines. Newer versions of the Unreal Engine have uh, a ray marched atmospheric cloud system, but we won't be talking about that today. We will instead be talking about clouds that you can just drag and drop anywhere in your scene at any height and have them work. And these clouds take the shape of bounding volumes that contain a pseudo volume texture. A pseudo volume texture is essentially a sprite sheet. Uh, each sprite's X resolution gives us the resolution of the width of the volume. Each sprite's Y resolution gives us the resolution of the Y axis of the volume. And the number of sprites gives us the vertical, the height resolution of our cloud. But how do we go about making a pseudo volume texture? Unreal has some built-in tools. However, I personally prefer Blender. See, these are the metaballs. The metaballs are an awesome technique to actually model fluffy, stylized using, uh, looking uh, clouds pretty easily. Uh, and once you do that, the next step is to convert them into a mesh and then take a cube, squeeze it real thin, and start taking intersections. Essentially, in order to make the sprite seat, we have an orthographic camera that's looking down, take each and every single one of the Boolean intersections, and then write them into a sprite sheet. Add some procedural Veronoi noise, some gradient noise for the opacity and the little wisps, and you have clouds in Unreal Engine at any height. So, characters. There were a lot of them for uh, just the two of us, but uh, nothing special was done in the creation of them. The, the process of creating a character from sculpt to UV unwrapping is pretty streamlined. Instead, I would like to take uh, this time to just um, spotlight two add-ons that really helped us out. They are the hair tool and the garment tool from Bartos Tiperek. Does anyone know of these tools? No, I'm surprised. Um, hair tool is an amazing tool for creating real-time hair, and you can bo uh, work both procedurally and uh, manually. Garment tool allows you to pretty much design uh, using splines uh, the, clo the clothing that you have in your mind, and then it converts it into a mesh and applies proper settings for stitching and simulation. From then on, you can convert into a whole enclosed hole and start baking on top. 
All right, rigging. Uh, rigging was a roller coaster of a ride. When we first began uh, the animation, uh, we knew that it, we didn't have all the time in the world. So we would have to split the difference between weight painting, a tedious process, and building controls, also a tedious process. Uh, for the faint of heart, please be careful when looking at the next slide. This is a trigger warning. This is how the initial rigs looked like. Just an FK spine with some IK limbs. Now, this rig is technically usable, just not very anima uh, animation friendly. You had to counter anima animate everything. After that, I took a good look at myself in the mirror and said, maybe I should implement controls. So that's what we did. We actually implemented proper torso controls, uh, twist bones for uh, the arms and legs, uh, uh, hand controls, and we even updated the IK to work. At the same time, however, I took a tutorial course from CG Dive on Rigify, and I fell in love with how easy it was to create awesome rigs. Uh, from that point on, all the rigs that we created were made with Rigify. And uh, you see our two characters here. And we also integrated into Rigify our own custom facial rig. Now, what this facial rig does, ha uh, does have is that it uh, can receive any uh, kind of controls that you want. And it is also a universal rig that we will be, uh, that we use in the animation for all our characters and that will be used, uh, hopefully, in the projects uh, following this one. It does, however, or Rigify, does, however, come with some caveats. And let me show you one of them. All right, so this is obviously a character that's not from the animation. Uh, it's uh, a character that we created from one, for one of our uh, game side projects. Uh, but it does squash and, st squash and stretch a lot, so it does display one of the issues. Uh, first issue is that this, if you are very observant, doesn't look like this one. <laughs> Uh, in Blender, you can select which bones inherit scale and which do not. However, once things are baked down and exported, they will not necessarily, uh, uh, they will have to necessarily inherit scale and have, uh, and have the result look like this. Uh, piling on top of that, we also have a huge, very complicated hierarchy, and this is just a deformed hierarchy, no extra bones here. Uh, and it's very difficult to work with something like that. So how do you go, uh, go about solving those issues? Well, for the hierarchy, there is an awesome add-on that automates the process of creating a game-ready deformation skeleton called UEFI. Uh, it's called UEFI, but in our experience, it will work for any engine, Godot, Unity, doesn't matter. Um, it uh, samples your meta rig and then creates a game-ready rig based on that. It inherits location, rotation, and scale from Rigify's built-in deformation bones. The problem is the deformation looks even worse on the right. Uh, so how do you go about solving that? Well, what we tried in the animation is to use an alembic geometry cache. Uh, this is Hop. He's a cartoony little guy. He likes to stretch and uh, squash a lot. And in the animation, we basically had a sort of a stunt double for Hop that would double him in the scenes where he would stretch, squash and stretch a lot. And that was made through a uh, alembic sequence, a geometry cache sequence. However, this is not a solution. This is a workaround. So we had to use something more substantial. So what was a common technique that most people used? Uh, the answer is flattening the hierarchy. If you flatten the hierarchy, uh, you get uh, what you see in Blender viewport in your uh, uh, game-ready viewport. Uh, however, this comes at the cost of the hierarchy. Uh, and you may be asking, why is the hierarchy important? Well, if you try to implement uh, post-processes in a real-time application, such as games, and post-process animations are uh, IKs, slope correction, uh, are my case when climbing, and of course, uh, Unreal has the con uh, its own control rig, it becomes way more difficult to work uh, with a flattened hierarchy uh, than it has to be. So what's the solution to that? Well, we developed an in-house add-on called Scalify. Scalify actually creates lift bones for each UEFI bone, 
and then uh, uh, skins the mesh to the newly created bones. Uh, see, since they are leaf bones, they have nowhere to inherit scale two. And in that way, you can have both post processes and squash and stretch. What's awesome about Scalify is that you can select which bones get Scalified and which don't. So you can have the limbs and the uh, spine be Scalified, uh, whereas bone dense areas such as the hand or the face do not have necessarily to be Scalified. All right, animation. Uh, now, animation was pretty forward. We mostly, it's mostly hand kid. Uh, we did, however, get ourselves on a uh, our hands on a Rococo motion capture suit, and we decided to implement uh, some motion capture. Here I am uh, uh, on the top left doing the movement that looks kind of like the movement I did. Um, retargeting, as, uh, sorry, uh, motion capture, however, did come with its own issues, and retargeting was in the foreground. Now, Rococo does provide an in-blender add-on for retargeting. However, for our workflow and our needs, it didn't work the way, uh, exactly the way we wanted. So we decided to implement a custom IK retargeting technique. Uh, have a look at it, just uh, as a reference. So first step is to actually get our characters into T-pose. Um, A-pose is great for sculpting and modeling, and works excellent, but um, when you're importing from uh, uh, Rococo or Rococo's motion library or Mixamo or any uh, motion capture uh, library, you will most likely, almost 100%, find uh, that the imported skeleton is in T-pose. So uh, get your uh, character into T-pose, it's the first step. Then you import, and once you've imported the source skeleton that has the motion capture data, you, we add an NLA layer. Uh, on, on top and scale it there. So this is an, an additive layer. Uh, the reason why we do that is so as to be able to swap the base layer uh, with another animation and still have the proper scale uh, applied to our source skeleton. And this is key in uh, creating proper IKs for our character. All right, now for the arms. It's a very simple process. You just parent the arm uh, IK target to the hand bone and the pull target to the upper arm bone. You do the exactly same thing for the legs. You parent the IK target to the foot bone and the uh, pull target to the thigh bone. They will get you pretty good uh, results. So for the head and neck, uh, just a simple copy rotation in local space will suffice. Um, as you can see here, the mix is set to before original. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, for the torso, we just parented to the pelvis. Uh, just to uh, be clear, all of those child off parentings happened at uh, frame zero, which is usually a T pose when importing a motion capture skeleton. But what about the spine? Do we use copy rotation? Do we use child off? The answer is that it's not that simple. See. Different skeletons, regardless if they are source skeletons or uh, your own uh, uh, character skeletons, have different amounts of bones in their spine. So uh, some may have four, some may have three. Newer versions of Unreal support six. And it's not easy to just uh, move from our source skeleton to our target skeleton. So what do we do? Well, something pretty common among Anima uh, among animation control rigs is the lower torso and upper torso controls. So what we do is insert an interme two intermediate bones, one that's parented to the very top of the spine and one that's parented to the very bottom of the spine. We then have the upper torso controls uh, control uh, track the upper one and the lower torso control track the lower one. Uh, tracking only includes rotation, and that's exactly what you need. And if you have set up the two controls properly, this will work pretty fine. This technique can even be used for clavicles. Now, clavicles, of course, can work with copy rotation. It's just 
way more time efficient to just add a, an intermediate bone at the end of your control rig's clavicle and have it parented to the shoulder bone of the source rig. And what's great about using child of constraints is that you can fix the silhouette and the pose of your character while still reading directly from your source skeleton. And why that's, that is important is because you have proper timing and spacing instead of just baking it down in an NLA action and using additives to fix it uh, uh, in, in addition to what you have in your base animation, which may spoil the timing and spacing of your uh, motion capture uh, data. All right. So um, after the animation has been done, we also need to animate the hair and the clothes. To do that, we decided to use simulation and to be more specific, bone physics. Now, while Unreal does provide a built-in solution to do that, we decided to bake it in Blender so we can have more artistic control. Um, even if Blender doesn't provide the built-in solution like Unreal does, it does provide us with all the right tools to create our own. Essentially, our workflow goes something like this. First, we create hit boxes for all the bones we want to simulate. Uh, these hit boxes are messes, roughly the shape of the affected region of the bones. Uh, then we enable rigid body physics for them and create rigid body constraints to connect them together, creating a chain. Uh, then we have the bones copy the movement of the heat boxes, either by using child of constraints or copy rotation constraints. Uh, a kinematic heat box has to be created for the rest of the body as well, so we can have accurate collisions. This is a very tedious task, and having to do this for every bone, for each action, will require a lot of time and doesn't allow for fast iterations. Uh, to help us uh, with our workflow and expedite the process, we developed uh, a tool, an add-on, uh, that automates a lot of these things. So what it does is it goes to the first frame of its action and connects connects the hit boxes we previously created to their appropriate bones, enables rigid body physics for them, creates the correct constraints, puts all the appropriate settings, and all we have to do is hit bake and just wait for a couple of seconds for the bake to be done. Um, the, this tool also allows for easy selection of the hit boxes and the bones so we can bake them and also allows us to disconnect them so we can move on to the next action. Uh, it also allows us to control the stiffness and the dubbing of the spring rigid body constraints. So um, we have body animation, we have secondary animation, but what about the facial expressions of the characters? While most of the work was animated by hand, uh, we wanted a faster solution, both for additional animation for, the, for this project, but also for our future projects. As, uh, you, sorry, using Apple's ARKit, as well as uh, any other application that allows facial motion capture, to, facial motion performance to be captured, to the 52 or so shape keys is one of the easier ways of adding facial uh, animation to a character. Uh, as we mentioned before, we use a universal facial rig for all, uh, our, for all our characters. Uh, so what we did is using this rig, we recreated all, the, all these shapes, all these 52 shape keys as skeletal poses instead. But why sacrifice fidelity that way, you may ask? Well, as long as we use this, uh, as we use this rig for all our characters, the poses can at least to some extent be transferred between them. Uh, to help us with our workflow, we developed another tool. Uh, now, the, what this tool does is um, is it samples the shape key data and transfers it to the, to the 
to the skeleton, to the skeletal actions and poses of our rigged character. Now, how does it work? First, we give it a list, as you can see over here, of which actions correspond to which shape keys. Then the add-on creates, um, uh, it populates the NLA track, as you can see on the left, with uh, tracks that each track being uh, one action. Then, uh, and it sets their influence type to combined. Then for every frame it, and for every shape key, it samples the value of the shape key and translates that to the NLA track influence. This can be done in real time, so the results can be viewed right away, and then can later be baked into an, into an independent action. Uh, another cool feature of this add-on is that, it, is that it, it, it can create a duplicate mess of, uh, of the rigged model, but with all the skeletal poses baked as individual shape keys instead. So you, we can use the shape key version of our character to capture the data and later using the same add-on tra transfer it back to the rigged character. Okay, last but not least, let us talk a bit about uh, the effects of the animation. Uh, after Oliver, the dragon, dives down from the broken dome window, he spews a jet of fire into Kernel, the bad guy. To do this, uh, after setting all the appropriate uh, animations and collisions, we set up a particle system, which we then used to drive a fluid simulation. Okay, so uh, we have the, the flamethrower-like effect, but how do we use this in Unreal? Well, Blender allows for fluid sims to be cast into a format called VDB which we can then import back into Blender and using the volume to mess modifier, as you can see here, uh, okay, uh, transform it into a geometry cast, which we can then export as an alembic geometry cast into Unreal. However, as you can guess, doing that will lose all the volumetric properties of the original fluid simulation. So we have to recreate a material that approximates the volumetric-like look. So uh, first, we applied a, a, no, a, a volumetric Voronoi texture that we created using the same uh, slicing method we created for we used for our clouds to introduce some noise. Then we applied uh, this flow map, we applied it triplanarly, so we can simulate the swirling-like effect of the fire. And then uh, we applied some uh, Fresnel effects, we added color, and we have our final result. So, the last part is lightning, and there is a lot of lightning in the animation and a lot of different techniques that we used to create it. However, the one that works with uh, basically any sparks uh, in a drag and drop fashion is the following. First, we model the, spark, uh, the arcs in Blender, and we use curves with a custom bevel. Um, the reason why we would do that is so as to be able to control procedurally the resolution of its curve. In real-time applications, performance is always an issue. Uh, we create the main curves, it's the ones that you see in the center here, and the flyaway curves, which are less probable to be visible. We convert it into a mesh and then unwrap in a 15-column sheet. We'll see why uh, in, uh, in a little bit. Uh, but uh, we actually unwrap the main ones uh, on the left, as you see, and the secondary ones on the rightmost part of the sheet. So, uh, this is the material. The material's first step is the probability that an arc is visible. And this will help you with the blinking effect of electricity. Uh, we have three st uh, strips that actually um, uh, scroll from left to right, and on the leftmost side, they act in a subtracting fashion, and on the rightmost most side of the material, they act at a, in an additive fashion. So in that way, the main, the main arcs will most likely be visible, while the secondary arcs will most likely be invisible. 
Uh, we then uh, used uh, uh, some textures to add displacement, similar to how you would do it in Blender. EV Next uh, will have it uh, if it doesn't already. Uh, and we also add a large offset to create the wild electrical look. We then use a multiplier matrix uh, texture. So this is basically, uh, to, we add to the 15 columns 10 rows and stretch them so as to fit the entire UV sheet. So what this texture does is scroll ver ver uh, vertically in a step manner and uh, assigns to its uh, of the arcs a different multiplier of intensity, giving it uh, uh, some uh, uniqueness. Oh, sorry. We don't thank you yet. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and this is the, uh, how the final effects uh, uh, looks like. And uh, I actually, it can work with any kind of shape. We use it at multiple parts in uh, the animation. It's just a shader that you just drag and drop. And now I can thank you. Thank you, guys. All right, so uh, first of all, I'd like to th uh, thank Blender for having us. It's honestly a huge honor for me, uh, for us. And I guess we've got a little time, so does anybody have any questions that they want to answer? Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, uh, from what you said, I believe you didn't use the Adam Blender to Unreal. So what was the exchange file for this thing? Uh, you, know, you know what's funny? He, he has memorized this question to answer you. <laughs> well, I, I haven't really. I just thought that it could be, uh, you know, a, a question that's going to come up. Well, um, we, mostly use, we mostly just uh, used the FBX, the normal FBX export uh, that Blender provides. Uh, you know, just make sure that if, the, if your model faces front in the, in the Blender viewport, it's going to face front in Unreal. And if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, front in Blender is minus Y, uh, and in Unreal, in Unreal it's X. Uh, so yeah, but um, we also used uh, another add-on. Uh, I, I think its name is uh, Blender to Unreal. Uh, um, I, I don't really remember the guy that made it. It's still a, in experimental mode uh, that allows for batch export. Of, we mostly used it for uh, for third-party assets that we imported into Blender, so we can fix pivot points and normals and bake some textures, uh, put some sockets in in Blender, so we don't have to do, do that in Unreal. Uh, yeah, and we use that add-on to export the the props, but. The characters uh, are exported, and the effects and the alembic sequences using uh, the defaults that Blender provides. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, about the exportation to uh, the rigs to Unreal, have you tried the game rig tools from the CG dive? Have you came across this one? Well, I took the course from uh, for Rigify. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, but uh, I, we actually have built uh, the. There were there are actually many more techniques to export. You can have an add-on counter animate basically the scale so as to have uh, the same scale in in hierarchy and skip the extra bones that we added. Uh, but uh, for us, since we actually when we built this uh, add-on, the Skellify add-on, uh, it didn't exist. The course uh, from CG Dive had uh, just been uh, introduced, and it didn't have the extra modules that he added uh, uh, later on. So that's why uh, we chose to stick by uh, our own add-on. Any more questions? Uh, is it, does it cover you? Yeah. Thank you. Right, guess, same thing. So, yeah, okay. Have a look on that. All right, thank you. So, uh, yes? Uh, so, when you work with the Alembic cache, uh, when you export it from Blender, it's always at a preset frame rate, right? So, how does the preset frame rate from Alembic cache work together with other animations which probably don't, don't have preset frame rate? Uh, 
Uh, so yeah, that's a valid question. Well, uh, in our animation, we decided that we want to work in 30 frames per second for the animation. So everything was baked in 30 uh, frames per second. Uh, however, I have found that uh, you can tell Unreal, if I'm not mistaken, the frame rate of the Olympic gas, and it will. I mean, if you're watching at 60 FPS, it will not play at double the speed. It will just interpolate. I mean, it, if I'm not mistaken, if it will hold uh, the frame and for two frames if it's on 60 FPS and you've imported a 30 FPS uh, Olympic cast. Uh, did, I, did I cover your question? Uh, yeah, we decided on 30 FPS, so we did the simulations at 30 FPS. Uh, yeah, but uh, I, I, I'm not real sure how it's going to work with other frame rates, but uh, b because we, we only did the renders at 30 FPS, we, the sequences in Unreal were actually uh, unlocked because we have some slow mo effects, and well, it's still buggy to use that with locked frame rates. Um, what I have found out that it, uh, is that Alembic Assis don't really care about uh, the final frame rate of the project. It will, I mean, if, if it's imported as a 30 FPS, it will play at, as if the project was playing at 30 FPS. It's a frame rate agnostic as far as, far, uh, I, as, far as I know. Any more questions? Right. Uh, essentially, it's just. Let me just. Uh, um, it's Unreal's uh, native solution for uh, volumetrics. It's the pseudo volume texture. That's how they call it. Uh, essentially, it will try to recreate something like a signed distance field kind of uh, shape, uh, but it will use set sprites. Uh, to do that. Uh, the, what the camera sees in that uh, um, demo is a top-down opacity of uh, pass of, the, of each slice. So what we're doing here is basically taking a mesh, slicing it in uh, different parts, and then making that the volume texture. Unreal has built-in tools uh, that can work even, even in VR to create a volume texture, but this is the workflow that I use for Blender to make things more stylized, more solid a little bit. Any more questions? Yeah? Yeah, so did most of them the work in Blender? Um, did you consider at some point uh, rendering the, the thing in, in, in Blender? Well, um, th th uh, Eevee is great. It's awesome. It sounds like I'm about to insult it now. No, I'm not. I, I, sp I spoke with Clement yesterday. I really admire him. Uh, um, the problem was that it doesn't support all the features that Unreal does. Unreal supports uh, channels for lightning. Uh, lighting. Uh, it supports um, uh, vertex offset. You can't do that in, uh, in, in Eevee right now. So it lacked many of the tools. And even the worst part for me is that while Eevee uh, works in real time, it renders very slowly. Unreal renders extremely fast uh, when you render, even if you're at the highest uh, preset. So Eevee is great. We actually use it in, in, uh, when animating. We used an add-on that converts normal maps to height maps so as to have uh, a faster iterations and be able to sh see the shading approximation of the characters in the viewport. Uh, we considered it. Uh, but uh, in the end of the day, we just use it for visualization purposes. Also, if you're using Unreal, free Quixel assets. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you can continue on that, what other benefits do you see with the Unreal workflow besides the real time thing? Excuse me? What other benefits or other values does the Unreal workflow give you? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. I mean, what can you speak up? Can you speak up a little bit? <laughs> what other benefits does the Unreal workflow give you besides the real time thing? I mean, the one thing you mentioned, the quick snap, you get also. Yeah. Know, you get Quixel assets, but also you get Niagara, which is an amazing FX uh, uh, module in Unreal. 
you get uh, basically uh, lights that have many different uh, controls. Um, and uh, if, if you're using it for, we, we could even do the physics theoretically in Unreal. It's so fast to iterate, to iterate there. And iteration is uh, f faster in Unreal than it is right now in Blender for our use case. Um, so uh, Niagara, awesome tool. Uh, the new volumetric uh, clouds that are Raymart, also an another awesome tool. Uh, it, it doesn't exist in Blender right now in uh, real time. Uh, and of course, soon, uh, Nanit and Lumen, which are two amazing tools in Unreal uh, that don't work great right now, but will be working great in a year from now. If uh, if, I, if I may add to this, uh, to, to, to this answer, uh, Unreal also provides uh, built-in uh, LOD systems and HLOD systems. And since we wanted the animation to, to run in real time as if it was uh, a cutscene in a video game, uh, we wanted to, you know, to, 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 sa to save some performance. And uh, outside the, the main hall of the library where the majority of the animation takes place. There are huge buildings, and since we, we mostly used uh, Quixel assets for that, uh, it's a lot of geometry there that we, we wanted LODs to, 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 to simplify all that and also use the dynamic instancing system of the... Yeah. So uh, I think uh, we're out of time. So, so thank you.